careers. And I think the basic assumption for students who go to art school is that the whole point is to get a job which is related to your field. And that is a totally sensible assumption if you go to college to study visual arts. But I think that it's not that straightforward for a lot of people. I think it's not as black and white as a lot of people think it is. I think that there's a lot of common misconceptions about an art job being the best thing for your life. Because first of all, there's no best case scenario for any particular artist. It really varies by the field you're in, your personal situation, what is the best situation for you? What's the best fit? Because really that's the most important thing about getting a job as an artist is what's gonna really work for you. I have a lot of colleagues and former students who do things for work, freelance work, or maybe they're doing some longer gig or something like that, that honestly would never work for me, but it works great for them. So it really depends. And I'm not trying to say that this is the best way or that's the worst way. I'm just trying to put it out there. So that way people really understand what their options are. And again, that things are not quite as straightforward as they seem like they should be. Because I think a lot of people, when they find out, oh, you went to art school, they just make the assumption like, oh, well, you have to work at a museum or you have to be doing freelance illustration, something very specific like that. But the thing is, there are certain fields and they have different requirements. Like, I think a lot of people make the assumption, oh, if you go to art school, you just work at a museum. I'm like, no, if you want to be a curator, that's a whole other field. That's a completely different set of degrees. Or I even have had people say things to me like, oh, just go teach art history. I'm like, yeah, except for the PhD, which I do not have in art history. So it's a little bit less obvious than that. Those of you who are joining the stream, feel free to jump into the chat box. Give me your opinion. Tell me what your thought is about an art job versus a non-art job as it relates to your own studio practice as an artist. I'd love to hear stories from people's friends, their own personal experiences. I think the more we can chime into the discussion with many different diverse voices, that's really helpful for everybody. One example I would give all of you is I was once speaking to one of my colleagues a few years ago, and he was very well established. He had a very successful gallery career, sold tons and tons of paintings. He had an art dealer for a long time, representation with a gallery. And he was also a professor at an art school and was actually department head of a major department. Okay, so on paper, all of that looks amazing, right? The thing is, he actually said to me at one point, you know what, I was a waiter for 15 years. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I was thinking, that's not that great. Like, I mean, I'm not trying to like be judgmental or anything, but if you're trying to make a living as an artist, you'd want to say, oh, well, you would hope that you were doing something in the field. I mean, being a waiter is not related to being an artist. Hello, Amaris. Thanks for jumping in the chat box. Let me know which all of you are thinking about this topic, or if you guys have questions that you'd like to ask me as well, I'm happy to do that. So my colleagues explained, well, I was a waiter for 15 years. And he said that when he was a waiter, he painted so much, had tons and tons of time to really focus on their studio practice. And they said another advantage to that was that they really felt that they had the headspace to paint because their job was totally unrelated to art. And so when he went to the studio, he really like could not wait to go to the studio and he could really just leave work behind. He didn't have to bring it home with him in any way, okay? I'm not trying to advocate, oh, everybody should go be a waiter because remember, this is about fit, okay? That would not have worked for me. It totally worked for him though. And he said that actually now, even though on paper, he's a professor at an art school and has a very successful career behind him, he actually doesn't paint very much because he has so many other responsibilities 
teaching at the art school and doing administrative work, that in terms of how it influenced his studio practice, he actually said he was way more productive when he was a waiter. And so again, it, it really, really depends on what you are after. Some people, their studio practice is less important. Some people, it's the most important thing. It's all about fit. Oh, Lahona is saying, knowing what I know now, I would not pursue a job for my abilities, but would rather do an entry level job that had no responsibilities to bring home in my head. Yeah, that's what my colleague basically said was that his position as a professor at an art school, it was so demanding because he was also doing administration. And that stuff takes up space in your head. It takes up a lot of concentration. And he was just so drained from doing all of that. He just did not have the time to get back in his studio. Tammy's got a question. They're a self-taught artist, but would love to show some work by the time I turn 50. It's always something I've wanted to do. Okay, so Tammy, I guess the way I can give it to you in a nutshell is you have to figure out what context you want to show your work in because there's a million options as far as artist co-ops, nonprofit organizations, commercial galleries, open studios events, if you want to sell your work. I think I would try to figure out where you fit because I know some people have no interest in showing in galleries. Other people, that's the only thing they want to do. So the important thing is that you decide what type of format you want to show your work in. And then from there, you can figure out how to target that particular venue because it depends on where you are. I mean, some people just want to know that, okay, I'm going to have a show every few years. So for some people, being in an artist co-op is actually a great option because an artist co-op, you basically pay a monthly fee. You oftentimes have some responsibilities like you have to gallery sit or something like that, go to meetings, but they basically guarantee that, okay, you're going to have a solo show every two years or every three years, whatever the situation is. For some artists, that's fabulous. Other people don't want to pay monthly fees, don't want to do all those responsibilities. So do the research in that area and then we can talk more. <laughs> okay. Lahona saying, I found these jobs were always demanding and took all my energy. I'd rather work at Timmy's or McDonald's. Yeah, I mean, that's why my colleague was actually saying, you know what, things were better for my studio practice when I was a waiter than they were when I was a professor. Leon saying, I'm interested to hear what worked for you. What got you into teaching and were you always practicing on the side? Great question. I'm actually going to get to that later in the stream. So I will get there. So just hang on. Okay. Now, another example that I want to give is that on the flip side of that, I had a peer who went to art school for animation and they actually got hired immediately after graduation at an independent animation studio. That sounds amazing, right? Like, oh my gosh, you majored in animation and like, boom, right away, you're in an independent animation studio. It sounds incredibly exciting. They got to work on all these commercials and all these really cool pieces. And that was exciting, but the thing is, it was a hard job and it was demanding and it was a full-time gig. And oftentimes they would have to work late. Sometimes they were in the studio until like midnight and they didn't even pay them overtime. The only thing they would do, they just would buy them dinner, which honestly is not really enough considering how much people put into a job like that. And so they were working at this animation studio. And the thing is when you're animating all day, from say nine o'clock to five o'clock, even maybe many hours beyond that, I can tell you the last thing you wanna do when you go home from that job is start animating your personal projects. You just don't have the energy for that. And so on the surface, this animation studio job looked great and it was definitely the type of thing that you show off to all your art school post-grad friends, but it ended up being not such a great job because they just had no headspace or time or energy for their own projects. And so I, it frustrates me because I think a lot of times people are very judgmental about particular jobs. Like, oh, well, if you do this, you failed. If you do this, you're successful. And again, it's not that black and white because sometimes these jobs that look so great on the outside actually are not. And so actually this peer did not end up staying at the independent animation studio 
because they just realized that it was not worth it. Like it just took up all of their energy and they didn't have any time for anything else. So let's get into my story. When I was a student in art school, I was really into oil painting, specifically figurative and portrait painting. That's pretty much all I wanted to do. That's all I did for my work. And I remember being a senior in art school and thinking to myself, well, what's a way that I can keep doing figurative and portrait paintings in oil, but it'll get paid at the same time. So I was lucky enough that my senior year in art school, I got to take a class with Tony Janello. And he's a portrait artist and he had a multi-decade career as a portrait painter. He did portrait commissions, all sorts of pieces and had a ton of experience. And I was so excited because I was like, oh my gosh, here's somebody who did exactly what I want to do. I am totally going to pick their brain about the business of portrait commissions and how to go about doing that. And I was so set on that because I thought to myself at the time, that is my dream job. I get paid to paint portraits in oil. That's amazing. So that was totally my number one goal. And actually, I really recommend you guys that you check out this video interview that I did with Tony. He's one of my friends now. And it's a great conversation because he talks a lot about this crayon technique that he invented. And actually, this crayon technique, I'll mention it again later, but it's actually on the Art Prof website. So if you guys go to tutorials, you click on the self-portrait drawing and crayon. This is exactly Tony's technique. I mean, it's not remotely as good as what he does, but I thought the least I can do is share his technique with the world. And we also have the same technique, but for still life drawing. So if you guys want to hear Tony's technique explained by me, that is on our tutorial site. But he's one of my absolute favorite artists ever, like in the whole planet, okay? And has had so much influence on me as a teacher. He's the person who really taught me color. So if any of you are struggling with color, watch this video because he completely, like I had been trying to learn color for so long and was just banging my head against the wall forever and ever and ever. And this was such a game changer for me to be in his class. So actually what I'm gonna do now is I am going to put the link for the video interview that I did with Tony in the chat box. And so maybe some of you guys can check that out later. So this is my video interview with portrait artist Tony Janello. Okay, so that's the YouTube link. And I'm also gonna give all of you the link for the tutorial. So the self portrait, See, self portrait drawing crayon tutorial is here. And on that same link, you will actually find lots of stills of Tony's crayon drawings. They're amazing. Oh my God, they're incredible. Oh, good. You watched the self portrait tutorial, Tammy. That's awesome. Yeah, I totally have color fear. I get it. I mean, like, some people are so good at color, and I'm so intensely jealous because. Color is not easy for me. It's not intuitive. It makes no sense to me. It's a total uphill battle the whole way. And I know other people, color is like breathing for them. And I'm just so intensely jealous of that. Um, so trust me, I feel you. But watch this video with Tony because he's incredible. Like the way he breaks down color is so smart. And I've never really heard anybody talk about it in that way. So definitely check out that video. All right. So I was very excited because I was like, oh my God, I get to study with this incredible portrait artist. And this is one of Tony's crayon drawings. Can you guys look, this is crayon. Like that's insane. Like, doesn't it look just like an oil painting? It's so amazing. And in fact, he actually did a lot of crayon drawings where you do crayon and then he would add like a glaze with oil. So some of them are like that, but I think a lot of them are just pure crayon. Oh, hello, yo LK. Great, nice to see you. Thanks for joining the stream, you guys. It's always nice to have all of you here and contributing your comments and your thoughts. So let me just show you a little bit more. Here's a detail of one of Tony's crayon drawings. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but it's all like little itty bitty tiny layers of crayon. And it's a crazy, it's, it's like 30 layers. It's not even 
like four or five. It's a ridiculous number of layers. And so I actually visited his studio. We had a whole conversation about his career and how he developed this technique. It's one of my favorite videos that we've done, but I think we haven't gotten to showcase it as much as I'd like to. So definitely look at this. And then I'll show you also, here's just a quicker sketch that he did. This was a model that he used to work with and he explains in the video, his relationship, it's great. Um, and then here's actually a self-portrait that Tony did many, many years later. And so it's really fun, I think, to look at his personal portraits. But basically he would just tell me these like nightmare stories about portrait clients. And I was really skeptical about it because I was like, yeah, but you get to paint all day. Like, isn't that just the greatest thing ever? And so I sort of brushed that off a little bit, just being in this days that, oh, being a portrait artist would just be like the best thing ever. But I discovered very quickly when I started doing commissions, oh my gosh, like I am totally convinced now that there's Dante's Inferno has like a place where they like keep you captive and you have to paint portrait commissions for eternity. Like that's how hard it is to do portrait commissions. Unfortunately, I can't show you a lot of the commissions that I've done because a lot of them are people who you might recognize. And for privacy reasons, I don't want to do that. But I can show you, this is one portrait that I did of a child a really long time. This is like, gosh, this is like 20 years ago. This is a really, really old painting. So here's a quick example. And I wanted to give this as a comparison against a more personal drawing. So for example, this is a portrait drawing, but this is one that I did actually of a model who I actually became friends with later. It was really cool. I've met so many cool people um, through models. And it's like, there's such a big difference. Like you can tell just in terms of the look and the feel of the drawing. I mean, I'm curious to hear from all of you because I've looked at these drawings a million times, what is the difference between this oil painting of a kid that I did do as a commission, it was commissioned by a parent, but then this is just a crayon sketch that I did of a model during a session. And I think there's a very visible difference. That's just me because of course, I was in a completely different mindset because what I discovered with the portrait commissions is that there's nothing that creative about it because you basically have to do whatever your client wants you to do. And so actually you don't get to make a lot of decisions. And sometimes you're between a rock and a hard place. Like there was this one time I did this portrait. It was of this woman's daughter. And she said to me, oh, well, the cheek, it, it looks too pink. And I said, okay, I'll tone it down a little bit. I tone it down oh, it's a little bit too pale. I'm like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> like, it just seemed like all the clients who I work with for portrait commissions, the only thing they were ever sure of is what they didn't like. And they could never articulate what they wanted. And even if they could have done that, there's no way it could have matched what in my head I was actually going to do for them. And just the clients were so unpleasant and so unreasonable. I just could not believe it. Like, here's an example. This did not happen to me. This happened to um, Tony Janello, who we were just talking about earlier. He said that he once did a portrait of an older man. He was probably like 80 or something, and he was totally bald. And they had this party where they were unveiling the portrait, and the man's wife was there at the unveiling. So they unveiled the portrait, and the first thing the wife says out loud is, oh my God, he's bald. It's like, yeah, like she was really upset that he looked bald in the portrait, even though he was bald. Like people just have such strange ideas about what they think they look like or what they should look like. Or, I mean, it's, it's just, it was so frustrating to me. And so I just felt like every single commission I did, some drama would happen. Like I would get yelled at because the client thought that I was trying to show their mortality because I drew a couple wrinkles on their face. I'm like, sorry, people have wrinkles when they're past the age of 50. That's just, unless you're Cher, you're going to have wrinkles on your face. And I remember Tony Janello 
Tammy's asking, did he wear a wig? Oh no, he did not wear a wig. He was just walking around bald like he was. And the wife was somehow startled that he looked bald in the portrait commission. It was very strange. And then I think Tony actually told me, I mean, I might be telling the story incorrectly, but it was some version of this where basically he did a portrait that somebody like rejected and like flat out wouldn't accept it. And they said, well, it doesn't look anything like me. And so <laughs> Tony like put it, cause I think he had like a storefront studio at the time. And he like put it in the storefront window and people were like, hey, you're in that storefront window. <laughs> like, just to like prove a point. It, yeah, it, it was really funny. Let's see, Katie's saying, wow, that sounds so creatively draining. Yeah, and it's it's like even more infuriating because it's like you're doing what you're supposed to love but you hate it. And that that's the part that really just kills you. Because at that point, you really would just rather not do it at all. Because I feel like there are things that I am passionate about and that I love. And if those things get ruined by being in a crappy situation, I'd rather just not do it and do something else. And so I think for some people, sometimes keeping your day job and your studio practice totally separate can actually make things much easier for you. I'm not just talking about time management and like spending time in the studio. I'm just talking about the headspace because the headspace in some ways is the most critical thing. Because if you don't feel that you can think clearly about your studio practice, it's like, it's not even worth it. It's not even worth doing that necessarily. And so actually I was just talking to one of my former students and I guess they've been out of school for like eight years or something like that. And for a very long time, they were pushing really hard to get freelance illustration gigs and they were doing commissions on the side. So they were really spending time marketing and doing all that stuff. And they said to me, you know what? I just decided this year, I don't want to do that anymore. And I think some people, again, would make that very quick judgment. Oh, he failed. He gave up. Oh, he did not try hard enough. But, you know, he said to me, he's like, I'd never been happier. Now what I do is I only paint what I want to paint when I'm excited to paint and I do it when I want and I'm doing this other day job to pay my bills and everything. And he said it was such a relief to just put all of that away. Now, again, this really varies from person to person because I definitely have worked with students, especially in illustration, who will say things to me like, I really want a prompt. Like they want to be told exactly what subject to do and what to explore. I mean, obviously there's a lot of creativity and room to do different things there, but they really want to be told, okay, here's an article, illustrate that. Not every artist is like that. Like I don't like prompts. I prefer to just do the work that I want to do. But some illustrators, I think it's a really wonderful creative challenge for them. They get very excited about, well, how am I going to portray this? And that, again, that's like a different type of artist that wants to work that way. So for somebody like that, working in freelance illustration is perfect because that's exactly part of their creative practice. But for me, doing those portrait commissions, like I have never been so upset <laughs> about my artwork ever. And I did do a couple, I did do a couple of commissions that were pretty good, that were pretty engaging. But the only reason that they weren't a total car crash is because I had enough experience at that point that I really knew how to guide the client, how to explain to them what the process would be. And I also figured out situations to really protect myself because, wow, people will abuse you as an artist. If you don't just put your foot down about what you will and will not do, it's just incredible what people ask of you. And so I actually had this one commission I did where the mother told me after I had done this extensive photo shoot, and this was before digital photos, okay? This is when you had to like shoot four rolls of film, drive it to CVS, get it developed, and then get like three photos out of a roll of 36 that are actually usable. So this, this was not like a small thing. And so... We had done all that and I was like 80% done with the portrait painting. And then she calls me up one day. She's like, I don't think I want to do that dark background anymore. I was like, why? She's like, oh, my mom's going to think it means death. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. But you couldn't have told me this like two months ago. <laughs> so I now 
if I do do a commission, I have very specific points in the process where I say people can request changes up to this point. And if they request changes beyond that point, I do charge additional fees, the whole kinds of things that I add into that contract to protect myself from situations like that. Because I pretty much at that point had to almost redo the entire painting from scratch because she wanted basically a different painting. Like she wanted a yellow background. She wanted to have her hair down, even though it was up. She wanted to wear a different sweater. I'm like, this is basically a different painting. So I learned my lesson. Let's see. Pasquale is saying, I've tried to make commission portraits, took all the fun from painting. Never again. Yep. <laughs> Anybody else here done a commission that drove them crazy? Because I sort of feel like, well, so here's the thing. I did one portrait commission that was so wonderful because the client liked everything that I did. Like I'd show them the stuff and they'd be like, great. What? And I just was like, what's wrong with you? Like, I was totally waiting for the other shoe to drop because I'd done all these other commissions that were driving me up the wall. And then I realized later that it was because the person who commissioned the portrait, they weren't in the painting. And I was like, okay, that sort of changes things <laughs> because the portrait was of their kids and their kids were two years old and they had no idea what was going on. And so when your client, the people who are actually in the painting, like don't actually know what's happening, it's a lot easier to get away with stuff. But if you guys actually look up John Singer Sargent and you read about his life as a portrait painter, I mean, I don't know how he did that. Like there's, I think I read somewhere, and again, this might be totally inaccurate, but I feel like I read in some book that he said he wanted written on his headstone, there's something wrong with the mouth. Because there was always something. <laughs> because you know what Tony Janello told me? He's such a genius. This is so great. He told me that when he brought his commission portraits to show to the client, he would actually purposefully paint part of the portrait really badly on purpose so that the client would feel that they had something to say. Because I think oftentimes clients feel obliged to have something to say in terms of feedback. Even if they don't, they just feel like it's necessary. And so Tony said to me that what he would do is he would like paint a collar on a shirt and he'd paint it really badly. So it looked terrible compared to the rest of the painting. And inevitably what would happen a lot of the time is the client would be like, oh my gosh, that collar is so messed up. You really got to fix that. And that was like no problem because it's a collar on a shirt. Like that's not hard. But it's like when people start like picking at, oh, the color of my cheek and oh, this wrinkle, like it just, oh my gosh, like it just never ends. And I just discovered that after a while when I was doing these portraits, I was just getting more and more stressed out. Like I would see an email pop into my inbox from a client and my heart would like skip a beat because I'd be like, oh my God, what now? <laughs> What's this next thing? Don't get me wrong. I feel like I've done at least two commissions that were truly wonderful and engaging and had really good clients. So I'm not saying this is always the case. I just think that most of the time, it's not fun for a lot of artists. John Cale is saying, tell him what Picasso told Gertrude Stein when she complained about her portrait he made of her. She said, I don't look like that. Picasso replied, no, but you will. <laughs> That's good. I should have used that. That I'm sure that would have gone over very well with my clients. And then I also would have clients, I would do a portrait of them and they would say things to me like, I don't think it's me yet, which is fine. I mean, I get that, but they would just disappear. Like I had a woman just disappeared. I was like, okay, so nothing. You don't want to tell me you want to just stop the portrait or, and I had one woman who had a total like meltdown, like shouting fit. I just was like, oh my gosh, this is really, really hard. And so after a while, I just dropped trying to do portrait commissions because it just caused me so much headache and grief. And I thought to myself, I'm, if I'm going to be painting, I want to be painting what I want to paint and not just be bowing down to everybody's weird, fussy comment about something that I'm going to mess up anyway. And so actually for me, I was teaching at the time at an elementary school when I was doing these portrait commissions. This is when I was really young. I was like right out of art school. I was probably like 24 or something like that. And so I eventually just dropped that. I was teaching at the elementary school. 
then I went to graduate school so I could teach college. And then I started teaching college. And for me, teaching is the perfect balance because the teaching part is my bread and butter. It's the monthly paycheck that I can expect every single week. I mean, kudos to those of you who can work freelance. I could never deal with the stress of freelance. I know some people do get to a point where it becomes less stressful because you're more established and you have professional relationships and stuff like that, but that takes time. Like that's not something you're gonna figure out in even a year or even five years or so. Some people it takes a really long time to build up that client list and that trust. And I know for a lot of freelance artists, one of the main things I hear a lot is for a lot of them, it's feast or famine. It's either, oh my gosh, I have so much work and it's killing me right now. Or wow, I haven't gotten a gig for two weeks. And I can't deal with the stress of that. I need to know that there's a paycheck coming at the end of the month. And so teaching was really good. And teaching's great because it is related to my field. I mean, certainly I get to talk about art all day with people. I don't get to make the art, but I find the conversations with the students and the discussions we have during critiques super stimulating and exciting. So even though I myself am not drawing when I'm teaching, I'm actually really thinking deeply about the procedure. And the students teach me. I mean, I feel like I've had so many art supply recommendations from students over the past few years that have been so important. Like one of my students, this was like in 2007 when I first started teaching, and they suggested to me that eraser stick that I'm sure a lot of you have heard me talk about. And it's like my favorite tool now. And I've totally like spread that to everybody else. Now it's their favorite tool. And I got that from a student. I get lots of things from students. I feel like they're teaching me half the time. So I lucked out that teaching really works. And so because I have that bread and butter, when I do my own studio practice, I just do whatever I want. I don't have to bow down to an art dealer. I don't have to stress about, oh no, I need to sell this number of paintings this month or, oh, this gallery wants me to do this, this, and this. I just do whatever I want. And I don't have to worry about selling. I don't have to worry, oh, if I have a gallery show, I have to sell out. I don't worry about any of that. And I know for some people, selling is very important. For me, it's not. It's just not a priority. I just think about making the work. If I sell it, great. It's just icing on the cake. I do not think about selling. I don't make work to sell. I know some artists do that. I'm just not interested in any of that. And again, this is me, okay? This, this is not going to work for everybody. For some people, that would be a bad fit. For other people, maybe yes. Jane Alvez is saying, I love this channel. I'm currently active duty in Army, but this channel helps motivate me to pursue art as another source of income. Oh, wow, that is really cool, Jane. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Let's see. Yo is saying, sounds to me before starting... Portrait commissions, you should first have a sit down session with the client to do some improvements they would like in Photoshop. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, everybody can make up their own procedure. And I think it really depends on what you want to do and what your procedure is. And so I always say to students when they ask me about, oh, what do I do for a commission? I'm like, look, you have to do like a consultation. Like you have to figure out if it's actually a good fit because some clients are not good fits and you have to spot the red flags early on and you have to really ask yourself is this worth your time because actually the one commission that was a total car this was the worst commission ever and i regret it a lot and i i did i did it like maybe 10 years ago or something so i sort of didn't have an excuse because i was already pretty seasoned at that point but i made some poor decisions and it was my fault but basically i worked with this client over email which by the way i don't recommend I only do commission portraits from people I can speak to in person because I think over email, people just have no filter. Like they feel like it's okay to just be rude. And I definitely discovered that here. So basically this client was so horrible to me when I showed them the finished stuff that I actually wrote them back and said, I'm giving you a full refund, we're done which I never do. Like I have never done that in my entire life. I mean, I already finished the commission and actually it was different. It wasn't a portrait commission. They wanted me to like recreate some of my crayon drawings, like make bigger versions of them and everything. And they just wrote me like, I think quite honestly, like the most horrible email I've ever gotten in my life that I was like, you know what? Nothing I do for this client is ever going to please them. And I don't want to deal with this crap. And so I just said, goodbye. And I still have those drawings, 
but I feel like I I sort of got out of it in a good way, even though I lost that time and everything. I mean, I can still sell those drawings. They're just copies of my drawings. So that's fine. But that was like the lesser of two evils. And I was like, okay, <laughs> we're just going to do this instead. Let's see. Yo K saying, sorry for painting you the way you actually look. Yeah, you don't, don't paint people the way they actually look. Like actually one of the clients I did a drawing for was a woman who was older. She wasn't like 80 or anything like that. She's probably like, I don't know, 55 or something like that. And she had a fit. She was so mad at me. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm not drawing wrinkles anymore on anybody ever again. <laughs> like, and the portrait that I actually ended up finishing and that they eventually did accept, I mean, it did not look like her, like at all. <laughs> it was just like, I don't know. I feel like I would be embarrassed to have a portrait that like really did not look like me. I felt like that was very awkward and strange. Okay, Maria Rev is saying, I want to pursue teaching art as well. I couldn't do the office job and have enough mental energy to come home and paint. But teaching makes me so excited about art and it's so fulfilling on the whole. Yeah, it is. I mean, I have to say though, you really have to be cut out for it. Like actually one of my former students called me up a little ways ago and they tried some teaching and they had felt really bad because they did this teaching gig that did not go well, that was really hard on them. And they felt like they had failed. And I said, it's okay if you don't like teaching. It's fine. Like not everybody likes it. It's, it can be a hard job. Like if you're not into it, it's not a good job to have because number one, doesn't pay great. And number two, you oftentimes are asked to do a lot of extra stuff you're not paid for. And it is, well, not all the time, but sometimes it can be a very thankless job. And I think every job has some degree of that. But I can imagine if you're somebody who just doesn't like teaching and you're dealing with all those factors, it just makes it much worse. Because the thing is that I know about teachers is most people don't teach for prestige because you usually don't get prestige in the same way. Like if you're showing at a major art museum, that's oftentimes in the art world considered more prestigious than being a teacher at an art school. So you really do have to love it. I happen to love it. So it's no problem for me. There is crap I have to deal with, but I'm okay with that. I'm like, you know what? It's worth it. It's fine. I can get through all that stuff and just focus on the things that I think really, really matter. Okay. So I, I guess what I would say to all of you is that these portrait commissions, I know that they look better on paper because people are like, wow, you did portrait commissions. That's really great. I'm like, yeah, I hated every minute of it. It was really bad. So it's not as black and white as you necessarily think it is. And again, I know some people who like ended up working at Pixar and they love it. It's the greatest thing because the thing is you can't create that on your own. Like you're a part of something so much bigger and I'm sure there's something very exciting about that. But the only thing that I really have done that's collaborative in terms of my work is really art prof because all my other studio work is just me. I don't collaborate. Like actually Eloise and Lauren Welch here on art prof, they are working on a collaboration and they have also collaborated with the artists and they are going to be doing a stream later this month to talk about that because for some people that works great, but I'm not like that. Like I'm totally a solo artist. Art prof is a little bit different because it's teaching and we're exchanging ideas and we, we actually laugh because we have so many lesson plans on our website and so often we go to artprop.org to find lesson plans. Like Casey actually was like, yeah, I was looking for lesson plans for the summer and I was looking at artprop.org. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I do that too. Like sometimes I'm like, hmm, what should I do this? And I'm like, okay, let's go to our own page. <laughs> or sometimes I have something about an art supply I want to know, but I will go to our own website <laughs> to look it up. I'm like, I guess I'm doing something right if I'm looking it up on my own website. Maria Reb is saying everyone really has what works for them. Yeah. And, you know, it, it sort of bothers me because I feel like in art school, again, there's a lot of assumptions about this job is bad. This job is good. And I don't think that anybody can say that because one of my artist friends, she has an artist friend. I don't know them. But she told me about this, that this artist friend had been, again, trying to like cobble together all these random freelance art gigs and everything. It was driving them crazy. And so at a certain point, they just gave up on doing that. And they just took this job with a company 
and I don't think it was like temping or anything like that, but it was like an office job and it was not related to the arts. But my friend said that this was such a game changer for her because number one, she actually had a steady paycheck. She didn't stress about that. She had a good paycheck. She could leave the job at work. She never had to do overtime or anything like that. And just like the security of that was everything because she knew that she could survive because I feel like a lot of artists, it's like you feel this pressure to like get all these gigs and that's exhausting to have to go from project to project and always being your own accountant and doing your own taxes, figuring out your old health insurance and everything. I mean, I'm sure some people do it and have a good system for doing that, but I just don't think it's as easy or as straightforward as people think. And so this artist who did end up taking like an office job was so much happier because it just fixed a lot of problems that they were having when they were trying to create a career as an artist. So I would just say, you guys don't write off anything because I was actually talking to my seniors this week because I teach a senior seminar class right now. And it's basically giving the students skills for how to navigate life after art school. And one of the students said to me, I feel so crappy that I have never done an internship before. And I was like, why? They were like, oh, well, because everybody else is doing an internship. And I really think I have to get an internship before I actually apply to a real job. And I said, no, you don't. I was like, just apply. Like nobody says you have to get an internship before you apply for a paid job because Again, internships, there's a huge range. There's some internships that are wonderful, that you learn a lot, you get to see the process, you meet a lot of people. There are some internships that are bad, like where you're just doing nothing. Like one of my students told me they were working at an art museum as an intern. And I said to them, wow, that's great. How did you get that internship? How did that go? And they said to me, actually, it was a terrible internship. I'm like, why? because I was basically a museum guard. So their internship was just standing in a gallery all day for the summer. Like that's a bad internship. She didn't get paid for it either. So it's a total waste of time. Like I would much rather just like go get a job and actually make money. Like sometimes that's more worthwhile than getting an internship for your resume. And so I was trying to explain to the students, like, look, if you can find a good internship opportunity, go for it. I mean, that's great, but don't feel pressure that to be successful, you have to have an internship. I never did an internship. I never had that on my resume at a certain point. And I know for some fields, it is very helpful. Like for example, Pixar Animation has very prestigious summer internships that are incredibly competitive and difficult to get. And so, yeah, of course, if you're in animation, why not? Why not apply for something like that? But I think that I just wish that people in the art field wouldn't be so judgmental about situations like to say, well, this person sold out or this person gave up or, oh my gosh, they couldn't handle it. Like, I don't think that's cool. I just think that, I don't think it's good to think about things being so boxed in. Like one of my students who graduated recently actually said to me that one of their frustrations was feeling at art school very boxed in that, okay, well, in this field, these are your options. And if you don't do those three things, you're a failure. I don't like that. That's too stressful. I think it's great when people just up and change things. Like I was just talking to my husband, like a few minutes before the stream, I was asking him about, oh, well, what if your peers from art school, what have they gone on to do? And did they do something that's an art job or are they doing something unrelated? And he said to me, he was like, yeah, well, actually these two friends that I went to school with, they have very thriving careers but the stuff that they're doing now has like nothing to do with what they studied in art school. It's so totally unrelated. And so I would just think a little bit more broadly, guys, because it's not as narrow as you think. There are many, many more options there for jobs than you actually think there are. Okay, I would love to recommend to all of you guys that you take advantage of Giving Tuesday, which is today, and consider contributing to the Art Prof Patreon to support us. Because number one, thank you so much to all of you who already support us on Patreon. We would not be here without those donations 
every single penny. We make it stretch. We make it happen. I mean, the TAs, when they come to my house to shoot, I make them sleep on air mattresses. I'm like, sorry guys, no hotel, no real bed, air mattresses. This is what we're going to do. I mean, obviously there's other things too, but um, so basically I would love for all of you to donate because even if you just give us a dollar, that goes a really long way. And also if you donate on Patreon, you are automatically entered into this monthly giveaway. Check this out guys. So on the monthly giveaway, we just pick one patron and you get to pick a prize. There's a lot of cool prizes. You can get an Instagram critique, a website critique, a portfolio critique. Usually we charge $200 for these, but you could in theory contribute a dollar every month, win the giveaway and get one of these just part of the giveaway. You can get mystery artwork from me. Something will show up, original artwork. You can get it from DD, Lauren. Casey has zines and comics that he's giving away. We also have mystery art supplies. So again, this is like a nice little surprise. Just art supplies, just show up on your doorstep. And we also have rewards. We have a Facebook critique group. You can post your work in there. We have exclusive content that we don't share anywhere else with anybody. And so it's a win-win situation, guys. So I'd really recommend that you guys think about doing that. Thank you to all of you who already support us. So thank you guys so much for tuning in and I will see you next time.